let me welcome you to the year 2000 ISPI conference. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, thank you all for coming here. This is the beginning of 99 seconds. And I want to begin by thanking my co-conspirator, Roger Addison, who helped me put these things together. This is one of those sessions where there are more presenters than members of the audience. <laughs> and the first ever 99 seconds started on 1984 when we had Diane Dormant as the vice president and she said, let's try something new. So we came up with the idea based on the empirically validated fact that in any given situation and in any given presentation session, if you're lucky, you get 99 seconds worth of good stuff. The rest is pure filling. So we thought, if we have everybody just do a 99 second presentation, we can save a lot of unnecessary hassle. There were many people who, when we suggested that, said, this won't play. Because here are many metacognitive reasons why this is a futile exercise. But it became one of the most popular activities. However, if you are a presenter, this is one of the most painful things for you to prepare. And as the great Hindu philosopher Mark Twain said, you want me to do a two-day workshop? I'm ready. You want me to do a 90-minute presentation? Give me three minutes. You want to do a 99-second presentation? It's going to take me a long, long time to reduce it to a succinct statement. So, could you all please join me in giving a round of applause for the masochistic presenters who are all lined up here. In case you don't know, 99 Seconds is online. Go to www.ispi.org. You can see 99 Seconds online. And just to refresh these highly anxious presenters exactly what is going to happen, I want to reassure them we have started a new compassionate, kinder 99 seconds came. <laughs> For all of you historians that used to be at the end of 99 seconds, the present presenter is gonged by the next presenter. So this year there are no gongs, we are gone high tag, 99 seconds will be counting down. Keep your peripheral vision focused when it is red, it is too late, so <laughs> speed up. And here is the procedure. When a previous speaker is talking, the next speaker goes, sits near the laptop computer, getting ready, centering herself or himself, taking deep breaths, telling herself, this is going to be a change, no problem and reassuring herself, if I'm going to make a fool of myself, thank God, at the end of 99 seconds, it's coming to an end. So this is no per uh, complete, permanent damage. Just today, just for this 99 seconds session, I'm able to invite, to kick off this session, a person, an alien, was been living amidst us 
pretending to be a human performance technologies. So we have great pleasure in presenting to you some highly out of the world objective observations and advice from Princess Ajwan from a planet far, far away. In my observation of human life forms, I became aware of the fact that people who are called ISPA members have the chip on shoulder approach which says, give me the data behind everything you say. As a shrewd observer, the princess, hey, come down. The princess has been willing to suggest to us that we willfully suspend our disbelief. We do not have to have the data to back up anything and everything we do. So just for today, pretend to be a normal human being <laughs> and give up this challenging attitude. This is a very efficient language. She says, in addition to the data business, there is this notion that as a participant, you got to come sit down and constantly ask yourself, what is in it for me? You have been trained to think if it is not for you, there is something wrong with the presenter. Where the princess comes from, there is an ancient saying that now is now. This is for you. And if you find it is not applicable to you, in the famous words of B.F. Skinner, it is all your fault. <laughs> so if you think the thing is not applicable to you, ask yourself, how can I take that and adjust it to meet my needs? Is to a suck out loud. I'm saying I think we're out of time, so we should stop. Thank you very much. I can't see anybody. I'm Gunnar Beef, and I've come from Brussels, Belgium, in order to tell you about a better way to motivate people. If you are driving into a town you haven't been to before, it is easier to find your way in the town to your goal if you have a good city map. If you want to motivate a person, it is easier to get to your goal with that person if you can first draw a motivation, a, a personality map of the person. In the session, A Better Way to Motivate People, you will learn how to draw such a personality map, and you will learn how you can teach yourself how to determine the person's personality type without testing. You will also learn how you can figure out what motivates, what motivates each person. Um, what motivates, uh, which are the person's hot buttons. With that, you can better motivate your customers to buy your services or your products. You can better motivate your employees to stay, take the necessary steps. You can teach this subject to others and you can use it for yourself. So come to the session, how to better motivate people. <laughs> okay, I think I'm on. 
My name is Mary Broad. I'm going to talk from the handout that you have, which is the third handout behind your cover page. May I ask my uh, co-thespians here, if you would, my stakeholder representatives, get your signs on and head out to the aisle, would you please? I have four collaborators who are going to help me with some of this. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about transfer of learning, down to 76 seconds already. Um, we need to understand that there are challenges of performance everywhere. One evidence out of many, and listed on that handout, a study by the conference board, only 2% of responding organizations said they had no problems getting performance. So we all know why we're here. There are some very important stakeholders in the performance arena. Uh, we have people who are performers or learners. Danielle is here. Uh, we have a representative of the managers, and that's Sandy coming up with her sign. We have a representatives of co co-workers or customers. Denny, there you are. Wonderful. Get over there, Denny, and start talking. <laughs> and we have Stuart, who is there he comes, and he's joining the group. These are our four major kinds of stakeholders in many organizations. There are others. They need to get together to talk about how to support that performance to make sure that it's something actually happens back on the job. Most of the time, things are in the way. Uh, we have just a visual to capture this. Keep talking, folks, plotting and planning. Uh, general performance development systems approach, very simple, basic system, but showing that the stakeholders are absolutely critical as a part, and we're all finished. All thespians, please take a bow. Thank you. Well, there's something I know, and as conference manager, I get my 99 seconds interrupted to tell you that this is available on videotape tomorrow morning. And by tomorrow evening, you can get it downstairs with books. Anyway, uh, on my speech, I'm talking mostly about a concept that I want to toss out. How many find it like me that it's very difficult to explain what human performance technology is to either our bosses or our clients, internal or external? And the rest of you are liars, okay? <laughs> if you're really stuck, try explaining it to your mom. You'll just lose it completely. And I toss out a question of whether or not it's because we're talking our language with our clients instead of their language. Maybe we should, instead of saying we, we address performance improvement through repeatable methodology, that we could say we can reduce the uncertainty of your operation in terms of its maintenance delivery. Uncertainty is a real element in many sciences, for example, science of measurement, metrology. Uncertainty is a component that actually has to be compensated for so that you can get these uh, results time after time again. And uncertainty, if we took it in human performance, might be an unexpected influence as a result of something different than what we expected in terms of outcomes. Influences we can identify. Compensating factors such as interventions we can identify and implement, thereby reduce uncertainty and make ourselves more useful to the supervisor, manager, and client and boss. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to share with you the myths and realities of web-based training, particularly sorting them out. What I'd like to do is share with you two tips I have for dealing with it. First is you have to educate your management. They're the people that are hearing most of the hype about web-based training. And my recommendation is start educating them as soon as possible around the costs of developing it, the delivery of it. And while we've heard a lot about just-in-time delivery, the development time is not just in time, so educating them about cycle times. It's never too early to start, so what you want to do is think about some concrete pages that are particularly good, put a note at the top and email them to the folks in management. Let them know that you're reading the top journals when you come across an article in Fast Company, Inside Technology Training, e-learning. Flag the article, send it on to them. When you get invitations to go to dog and pony shows, the demos from the vendors, don't shy away. Take a couple of people from management with you, and when you're finished, debrief. What did they see? What did they hear? Can you use it in the company or can't you? That's my first piece of advice, educate management. Second one, take your time. You need to make sure that when you go in, you do an incredible needs assessment. My handout is to give you some food for thought. Think about who your audience is. We talk about a worldwide audience. In 2002, the majority of people on the web will be not English-speaking people. Another one is the rest of the world is not as wired as we are. Next, think about doing a pilot. You absolutely want to do pilots because undoing web-based training is like undoing ERP. You don't want to go there. 
So as you debunk those myths of web-based training, it has a lot to offer, but it's your job to educate management and continue to educate them, but it's also your responsibility to make sure you take it slowly. You want to just you know, implement a solution for the sake of the solution. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Eikenberg. Take one second to think about what you've invested to get here this week. The time, the money, whether it's your money or your organization's money. Take a minute just to think about that investment. What I want to do for the next 89 seconds is talk to you about how you can get more for that investment. The first thing I want you to do before 8.30 tomorrow morning is set some goals. What do you want to accomplish over the next few days? Write those goals down and then let those goals be your guide. All of you have a, have a booklet that talks about all of the many opportunities you have over the next few days. Have a plan. Write your plan down. Decide what you're going to do when. Third, find someone to go to lunch with. If you eat lunch by yourself this week, you're making a mistake. Maybe there's someone you'd really like to meet. Invite them. They'll probably go with you. Fourth, network. Take every opportunity you can to network with the people that sit beside you before a session, in the hallway, and that sort of thing. Five, take some notes. Most important, take some action steps. Daryl Sink's going to tell you a little bit more about how to take care of those action steps later, but get an idea, write them down after each session. Next, have some fun. Let serendipity be your guide. Maybe you change your plan at the last minute. That's okay. Six, get some sleep. Maybe it's seven. I don't know. Get some sleep. You may have trouble balancing this have fun and getting sleep thing, but do it. And lastly, two things when you get home or on your way home. Number one, review what you've learned. Think about it and start to sort it out and review it several times over the next week. And lastly, take a chance to send some thank you notes to those that you learned from this week. Thanks.
And for some strange reason, they stopped doing that. So what I want you to do is turn to a partner, and from a human performance technology point of view, tell your partner the lesson that this story shows. On your mark, get set, go. Well, I don't, I don't know what you got, um, but uh, you know, a lot of people would say something like, it's a good idea to use a motivational intervention for a motivational problem. And I thank you very much. And I have one question for you. If we're so smart, why aren't we rich? <laughs> uh, we're all here at this conference, and we know a lot about human performance technology. Uh, there's a lot of data to, prac to uh, back up our methodology. And I think we're all really anxious to uh, employ the methods that we're learning. But the research shows that we have a very hard time implementing these new practices. Uh, thanks to ISPI, I uh, had a small grant, uh, small, <laughs> hint, hint, uh, we could use some more support, to, to try to find out what are some of the barriers to implementing things. And we came up with a couple. One is language. We don't really speak the language of business. Partly is professional stance. Often when something really works, we're secretive about it rather than sharing our success with others. A third thing um, is our professional uh, uh, openness uh, or professional stance of being reactive rather than proactive. Many of us wait for clients to come to us and tell us what they want rather than going out and uncovering some of the performance problems. And organizational change often derails where we're going. Uh, often there's a change in management, we're headed down a particular path, and then all of a sudden it backfires. But Acquire business literacy, be able to look at financial statements, get some outside recognition, get an article published, send your executives notes and articles, uh, make an appointment, take an executive to lunch tomorrow or next week, collaborate with your counterparts in human resources, communication, IT, uh, look on change as challenges and an opportunity to get HPT uh, established, and finally, possibly change your organizational home base. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lori Gillespie, and I don't have a handout, so don't look for it. But I need everybody to stand up. How many of you have a good sense of balance? I don't see very many hands. How many of you would like to improve your sense of balance? Uh, we're going to try to do that today. Uh, how many of you think you can improve your sense of balance? Not very many. <laughs> Let's try this. Everybody, put your feet a little farther apart. Center yourself over them. Okay, now try something. Lift one foot. <laughs> what happens? Yeah, you fall over. So one of the first things that you need to learn about balance is finding where your center of balance is. So that when your legs are apart, it's through the between, the between your legs to the ground. If you need to get to one leg, you have to move to the one leg that you're going to balance on. So lean to the right or the left, balance on your leg. So that's the knowledge transfer part of it. Now we're going to try the practice part of it. I want everyone to balance on your right leg and lift your left leg and hold it. Yeah. You might want to find your neighbor's shoulder. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. How are you doing? Yeah. All right. Practice this every day. Now on the left side. Let's try it on the left leg. Lift the right leg. How are you doing? Not too bad. I don't see too much bobbles. My left leg's my bad one. Pretty good. 
practice this every day when you put on your pants, you'll get better. <laughs> My name's Barbara Goff. I'm here to tell you about a neat instructional design tool called a, a chunk diagram. I'm going to give you some tips. The how to do it is in your handout. First thing you want to do is get your tools together. You need a sticky notes, flip chart, markers, and some tape. You need to put the right people in the room. Make sure you have your subject matter experts, your uh, instructional designers, your developers, and most important, your customers. You need to get them to brainstorm tasks. Step number one, make sure you give them a list of verbs because they're not going to be used to thinking in the same terminology that we're used to thinking in. Start collecting the flip the sticky notes. Have them put one per stick thought per sticky note on there. Make sure that you allow them to continue to add sticky notes. Then you want to sequence and prioritize the sticky notes. When you get done, you'll have a process across the top and procedures across the bottom. Now there's some really cool things to this. The first is that while you have all these people in the room, you can collect some activities. You can validate whether the activities will work with the target audience. You can collect some information for case studies, for exercises, for role plays. You can get names and phone numbers of resources that you can call. And the really coolest thing is the customer, the stakeholder, has just helped you create a two-day course. But he's asked you for a one-day course. So now he gets to look at the course he just designed and all of the information he just puts up there and he gets to decide which, which topics he wants to eliminate from the course. That's really cool. Thank you. All right, before we get started, I, I need a little bit of help. Uh, somebody give me an example of a simple task. Making coffee. Making coffee. What's that? You know, digging a hole. That Making coffee, those all sound pretty easy. Let's try digging a hole. Let's check that baby out. Is that pretty simple? Come on, we got to get that 500 up, for the we're kid. Gonna find Come out. on. What we need to, what he just said is we got to get that 500 for the kid. Now, what he meant by that is I have to set some clear goals for you guys. Uh, after, he ha after he's done that, what do we need? We need some clear direction and some tools. Where do we start? Right here. Give me the tool. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, stop dancing. We got work to do. Where's the mat? Right here. Well... Then you need to give your well-trained team some incentive, and then you got to let them go to work. The idea is to get the dirt out of the hole. Now get shoveling. And what are the results? Always successful <coughs> task Look, accomplishment. Look, it's open. Under the room. Come on. We found it. Now Jimmy can get his operation. There's enough here for all of us to have an operation. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, the, so for your well-trained team, remember, ensure the goals are clear, ensure they have the tools and direction they need to accomplish their mission, give them great incentives for performing well, and then let them go to work. They'll surprise you with their ingenuity. Thank you. Elizabeth Hill and I'm the CEO of Mobbit.com. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the five steps for developing a great website. And what's amazing about these steps is that they're very similar to the five rules of dating. Okay, so first, know who you're targeting. In dating, someone can't go after five different people at once and expect them all to be interested. So that's just like on the web where it's impossible to focus on 50 different things at the same time. Um, the second thing is don't be intimidated. If you're thinking about moving your business to the web, do it because the future is E. 
Um, if a girl's thinking about asking a guy out and never goes through with it, it's totally certain that he's going to find somebody else. So, um, well, if you don't let the um, harsh crowd of web surfers intimidate you, because if you do, you run the risk of your great idea never taking shape. Um, the third thing is keep your web pages simple. Too many colors, ads, and unimportant pictures take the visitor's attention away from the real point of your site. It's also really slow. Um, with dating, if a guy's trying to ask a girl out and takes too long trying to do that, she's going to be bored out of her mind before he ever gets out to asking her. Um, and that's, um, okay, so that's one reason, and because he was too slow. Um, number four, measure the results. You need to know visitor's return and why. Um, for dating, it's always a lot less stressful to know if the night out was fun for the other person. Um, number five, listen to feedback and adjust as needed. Um, okay, so this isn't like dating because obviously if someone suggested that I adjust, I drop them on the spot. So, um, so, so those, so those are the five steps. Um, know who you're targeting, don't be intimidated, keep it simple, measure the results, listen to feedback and adjust as needed. Remember these and your websites along with your dates can be a lot more successful. tough to follow that one. My name is Carolyn Hone and in the next 99 seconds we're going to have a ball learning about the 40 competencies of an HPI practitioner. Number one, industry awareness, leadership skills, interpersonal relationship skills, technological awareness and understanding, problem solving skills, systems thinking and understanding, performance understanding, knowledge of interventions, business understanding, organization understanding, negotiating, contracting skills, buy-in advocacy skills, coping skills, ability to see the big picture, consulting skills, project management skills, when you find yourself in the role of the analyst, you will get performance analysis skills, needs analysis, survey design and development skills, competency identification skills, questioning skills, analytical skills, work environment analytical skills in the intervention specialist role you need to have performance information interpretation skills, intervention selection skills, performance change interpretation skills, ability to assess relationship amongst interventions, ability to identify critical business issues and changes, goal implementation skills, change manager needs to have change implementation skills, change impetus skills, communication channel informal network and alliance understanding, group dynamics process understanding, process consultation skills, facilitation skills, and evaluate a role you need performance gap skills, ability to evaluate results against organizational goals, standard setting skills, ability to assess impact on culture, human performance improvement, intervention review skills, and finally, feedback skills. <laughs> That was great, Elizabeth. By the way, I just want to tell you there are some times when it's okay for the guy to be slow. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm Mickey Lane, and I'd like to talk to you about subject matter experts. How many of you work with subject matter experts? Yeah, a lot of us do work with subject matter experts. One of the things that I've found with working with subject matter experts is that when you ask them what a new performer needs to know how to do in order to do their job effectively, they'll start to tell you everything they ever learned in their whole life. Now, somehow we have to pare that back a little bit because we're not going to be able to include that in all the intervention. And one of the tools that we use is something called, with apologies to Kino Reeves, the matrix. And in the matrix, we ask one question, one very straightforward question. If we do not include this material, this content in that intervention, what is the chance that the learner or the performer is going to make an error? And if they do, what are the consequences of that error? Is it going to be tough for them? Is it going to be tough for the organization? If you find that both of these are high, then you better include that topic or that content in the intervention. If one is high and one is low, you make the decisions as to whether or not it's going to be critical. If they happen to be both low, in other words, if no chance for error or very minimal chance for error and the consequence of that error is very low, this is a good opportunity to take some content out of the intervention.
Now, that is, of course, unless you've got some regulatory or certification issues, you better include that in as well. We found by using this matrix, we've been able to drop out between 35 and 40 percent of the content that the subject matter expert originally said was critical for that intervention. Thank you. My name is Ogden Lindsley, and we're going to sing my presentation to the tune of Jingle Bells. The words, the words are on your handout. They're also on the overhead. So here we go. How does performance grow as we chart it day by day? To change it, we must know. To forecast, we must say. Multiply, multiply, multiply each week. That's how our performance grows to the fluency we seek. Start with zero. No! To that there's no debate. We must have one to grow. To two, then four, then eight. Multiply, multiply, multiply each week. That's how our performance grows to the fluency we seek. Do errors go away when corrects go up each day? It's not as you think. They go their own way. Multiply, multiply, multiply each week. That's how our performance grows to the fluency we seek. Our middle guy does 10. A middle day 50. And the lowest day is 10. Will top day be 90? No, top 250. Multiply, multiply, multiply each week. That's how our performance grows to the fluency we seek. Middle guy does 10, and a bottom guy does 2. Will top guy do 18? No, top guy does 50. Multiply, multiply, multiply each week. That's how our performance grows to the fluency we seek. Thank you. I've had, to, uh, I've had to edit my material because the cute little CEO is 14. The handout, which is available, <clears throat> the handout, which is available, a few in the back and, and others, uh, if you ask me for one, is unexpurgated, and uh, so if you're interested, go ahead. For about 30 years, I've been doing presentations and writing for uh, this august body, and I've had to leave out a lot of lines. And so in this interactive presentation, your line is, and another thing, and my line is the point that I left out all those years ago. First, let me hear it. Distance learning, for the most part, isn't. One size never fits all. Self-esteem does not build performance competence. But performance competence does a hell of a lot for self-esteem. Okay, I think we'll periodically go with that when I signal you. I'm a little tired of hearing you as you are of me. 87.3% of ISPI members talk about reading Tom Gilbert. Studies show 3.78 have actually read Tom Gilbert. <laughs> Worry about your own damn cholesterol. <laughs> Multimedia ain't magic, folks. It's a simulation design decision. Technology, all of it, is merely an electronic screwdriver. The check, even yours, is never in the mail. Data are plural, and by the way, where are your damn data? <laughs> Credibility of a consultant correlates positively with the number of miles flown to get to the client. There are three billable days in any 24-hour period. Get off the computer, get some sun, roll in the hay, drink some fine wine. You and everyone else will feel better. Thank you. I wrote a presentation. It was organized just right. I, was, I rehearsed it all and timed it out. I stayed up half the night. I had a working model of the gizmo there to show. Had everything in order was all set to go. Then the power went out. The entire
entire world shut down. I couldn't see a single thing in any part of town. The power went out, so I just shriek and moan. Why the hell do I ever leave my flip chart at home? I had a fancy laptop and projection system, too. An overhead projector and a video to view. A computer simulation was made specially for me, with book up to the mainframe back in Memphis, Tennessee. But the power went out. The entire world shut down. I couldn't see a single thing in any part of town. The power went out, so I just shriek and moan. Why the hell do I ever leave that flip chart at home? So there are two points here. Keep media as simple as you can. And always, always, always have a plan B. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Mager. You work hard on your presentation, and you want them to be a hit, as well you should. One surefire way to ensure the success and the memorability of your presentations is to be so well prepared and so well timed that you finish, shut up, and sit down before people expect you to. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pierre Morier. Because my name is spelled this way, my presentation falls between Mager and Murray. So I'm just going to run away right now. <laughs> Having said that, though, I'm here to talk about flexibility charts. Very easy. Indicate employees up the top the skills that they are required to uh, perform either in the existing environment or in a new environment, and make a determination of how well are they able to do the job, are they fully competent? Can they do it with training or can they not do it? This will enable you to identify strategic risks. For example, here's only one person who can do the job. Uh, none of them can do it with training. Here's, for example, a whole bunch of people who can do it with training. Would that be a training opportunity? And how about this person here who cannot do anything? This is really easy to read, so you'll see it in the handouts, which are not included in the packet, but available down at the bottom. The purpose of this tool is to do a quick and dirty view of human, re human resource capacity. It can be used to determine training needs, impl implement organizational ch change, critical when you're doing process improvement, find out if you have the skills that you need, succession planning, assessing uh, capacities, and so on. And I think, oh, I still have plenty of time. Um, Okay, so let's take a breather. I want to see what this looks like from down here, actually. Okay, managers can use this either in the existing framework or the way it should be. And they, can, they rate their employees in each department, as you can see here. And then they uh, find out how to fill the gap. Good afternoon, I'm Margot Murray, and when I titled this 90-second presentation, Focus Groups for Facts and Fun, I had no idea how much fun we'd have before we got to my session, so hold that thought. Focus Groups are well known uh, for their use in market research, and they're also useful, extremely valuable in getting your stakeholders' input and involvement in things like needs assessment and readiness assessment. If you want to involve the client, as was mentioned by a previous speaker, and get their commitment early on, include them in a focus group. They're adaptable. You can make quick changes on your feet, even if you didn't bring your flip charts, Eileen. And it encourages con consensus. However, you don't want to use them if you're looking for divergent opinions or for the broader spectrum. And they're easy to summarize. You do have this in your handout, so I'm going to go very fast. How am I doing? Good. Uh, in preparing, first of all, clarify the client's problem. Do they want to make a decision or they just uh, 
wanting you to gather information, and then outline the topic questions that you'll use. Then recruit the participants. You're looking for the widest range of diversity, and typically six to 10 or 12 people will be sufficient. Arrange the site and the equipment. If you're lucky enough to get a site that has one-way glass and recording equipment, that's very useful, but you'll want a backup of a note taker as well. Prepare the flip charts. What I typically do is put one question or topic at the very top of each flip chart page and then leave a blank page. And then as you capture the input from the participants, turn the page, don't keep them posted. You want them to focus on one question at a time. As you facilitate, explain the process. A focus group is not an open discussion. Guide the discussion and make sure you keep them on target and control the participation and yet have the flexibility to go back to earlier questions. And the rest of it you can read. <laughs> Hello. Silence. It's a difficult topic to talk about. In modern organizations, sometimes the systems we use to manage people can result in oppression, st stress, humiliation, and silencing. I offer a new way to put the human in human performance technology, human rights, human responsibilities, human relationships. These form a dynamic cycle of human resources, the strengths we have to create effective workplaces. A simple way to improve performance, treat people with dignity and respect, and we will all excel. Know your rights, accept your responsibilities, honor your relationships. Herein, we can find renewal for ourselves, our profession, and our world. For this, I strive for a competency of compassion and for a technology of trust. Together, we can break the cycles of oppression and silence ideas for change. So now what? Introduce yourself. Reflect on how you may have been silenced and how you may silence others. Then let me know what you think. I'm Todd Packer. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Panza. Many organizations continue to be managed the way they are structured, which tends to be functional and vertical. However, there is significant advantage in managing organizations the way they operate, which is horizontal and crosses functional lines. As Gary Rumler likes to say, we need to get control of the white space between the boxes on the organization chart. We also need to begin at the macro level of the organization. If we don't, and define the context up front, and begin at the process level, we run the risk of maximizing for a process or function, rather than optimizing for the organization, which should be our goal. This is an example of an organization map, which defines the performance context for a whole organization or a part of an organization. Uh, and it's also very valuable for identifying improvement opportunities. However, don't stop with an accurate, complete picture because you can take the same picture and make a far more understandable, user-friendly and usable uh, impression by considering what I call the art part. And in fact, by simply adding some color, we were able to take a lot of the noise out of the picture and hopefully avoid the possibility that our client would run out of the room screaming, but maybe not. Thank you. Hi. 
Hi, welcome to Metaphors in Your HPT Life. You do have a handout. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about what is a metaphor. It is a, a group of words that you transform into some other image to make a complex concept, many of which we HPTers have, into something simple that your audience can understand. So we're talking about the idea of taking something that is not easy to understand, you working that idea into something that will make it easier to understand and transferring that to your audience so they can understand the concept. When you use metaphors, there are three good reasons. One is it's very quick to understand. Second of all, it is a very, uh, it's a deeper understanding, especially if you're with a heterogeneous group or with um, uh, multicultural groups. If you have an image, most people can relate to images. They may not relate to your string of words. And the third is that when you leave, you have an image in your mind. You don't have a string of words to try to remember. And images stay in your memory much longer than a string of words. And I have brought for you today an excellent metaphor of what I mean. This is called a Canton Sphere. I have an overhead. Just hold on. This is called a Canton Sphere. It is a symbol of good luck in China. And it is a, a, at least seven concentric circles, all of which have holes in them. But as you may be able to see here or in the overhead, You cannot see through to the middle. So the complex idea that you're holding in your head has all of these layers, and they're not very clear to the people that you're talking to. So what can you do to make them clearer? You start to think about how to simplify that complex concept into something easier for you. And what you end up doing, if you have a good metaphor, is to translate that into a concept that goes straight to the middle of the sphere which means that you have hit your audience on target and you've made your point. Thank you. Oops, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Gloria Regalbuto and I launch corporate universities. And I've often felt that uh, I only had 99 seconds to launch a corporate university. Um, but since I only have 99 seconds to tell you what I've learned over the last something like 14 years launching about nine of these, what I want to tell you are like six unskippable steps in launching corporate universities. And the very first one is to find out what they mean by that. Are they talking about a building? Are they talking about a set of classes? Are they talking about performance technology or performance consulting? Or are they even talking about knowledge management? or intellectual capital management. There's a continuum. Find out what it is and give it to them. If they're at the low end of the continuum, work real hard to move them forward later. Um, the second thing, design elements of the university to support the corporate vision, mission, and strategy. And don't stray from that. There's no point in doing anything else. The third thing is to use a two-pronged strategy because you have to get results fast. So you need a quick start and you need a long term. And the quick start is steal Make, buy, convert, work with what you've got to deliver something speedily. And the other one is to analyze what's needed, change performance on a long-term basis, but do both simultaneously. The th uh, fourth thing is to clone yourself. There's never enough labor. So take the existing labor you have available and make or buy performance consultants. And that's the easiest thing to do to get moving more quickly. The fifth thing is something way back when, when I was working at Anchor Hacking, a glass maker taught me, which was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Pick the programs, interventions, strategies, which are functioning and have a lot of credibility, and build on them. Use them. They'll give you another quick start. Um, the last thing is deliver and measure. And deliver really means, um, in any corporation, what you've done for me lately is all that counts. So do it, whatever it is. Measure it. If it isn't working, believe in continuous improvement and fix on the fly. Change the tire at 55 miles an hour. Do what you have to do to get it working. The last thing I want to tell you is not an unskippable step. It's something you have to remember. It takes about two and a half years to do this. Be patient with yourself and with them because you need it. Thank you. I'm Ray Robertson, 
and I invented performance analysis. <laughs> Together with my business partner, Al Gore, who invented the internet. <laughs> you know, the society has been instrumental in shifting the focus from training as the prevalent answer for performance problems to tailored solutions like job redesign, performance support, incentive systems, and many other interventions of which training is one. That shift in focus has sparked the development of a fundamental tool of our profession, performance analysis. Among the mental models that are available to us, I'm especially fond of these four boxes. They're often referred to collectively as the bridge matrix because they form a simple but effective bridge from appraising a problem on one side to firming up a solution on the other. They remind us that we cannot offer convincing solutions to clients' perceived performance problems until we first impartially analyze the situation, identifying the discrepancies between what is and what should be, determine the probable causes of that discrepancy, diagnose the problem by setting standards that highlight the gap between actual and desired, and finally synthesize, that is, combine the elements into a whole to show the patterns and relationships that suggest solutions that target importance, value, and improvement. I think performance analysis is the gateway to that set of skills that we encourage the world to recognize as the profession of the performance technologist. Getting that, techno that recognition depends on us. Thank you. Testing. Good afternoon, I'm Daryl Sink, and what I'd like to do today is share with you a tool for helping you to sort through all these wonderful ideas that you're hearing about up here. We use it a lot with brainstorming and things like that tool uh, in, in our own organization. We come back from a conference or a workshop, we say, what are we going to do with all these ideas? So here's how it goes. First of all, you've got to list the ideas. And uh, Kevin Eikenberry mentioned this as part of his strategy for you here at the conference along with uh, building a plan for yourself, is to capture those ideas. Okay, now that you have the ideas, what do you do then? Well, we suggest that you take each idea and subject it to these four criteria. Is it achievable? That is, is it practical, straightforward, you'll be able to actually implement it when you get back home. Second, beneficial. That is, does its value outweigh its cost? And uh, third, compatibility. Will it fit into your organization, or will it take an enormous amount of energy to put this into place? And divisible. Is it something that can be implemented in parts or in phases? If so, that's, all of these will help that uh, change or idea to take place. So you first uh, look at each idea and apply these four criteria. The ones that score high, then, what we'd like you to do is consider then taking those and rank ordering them. So that's our last one. So we need to prioritize our ideas, rank order them. And the reason for this is it is awfully hard to implement new ideas of some uh, stature or substance. And so narrowing it down to just one or two that you can go back and make a very careful implementation plan and follow through on, and uh, you'll get a lot more, I think, out of all of those I wonderful ideas you're going to be hearing uh, the rest of this week and are hearing in this presentation. Thank you. Rob Fauchet, I'd like to uh, explode a myth that you may have. Learning styles are something that sound like they ought to exist. Uh, after all, we've all taught classes. Uh, some people get it, some people don't. There must be a reason other than the fact that uh, maybe we're good at it, maybe we're not. Uh, but the reality, unfortunately, is that it ain't that simple. Uh, uh, there is no consistent definition of what a learning style is. Uh, we, don't, we can't really decide on who's got which learning style in any really good way. Uh, we don't really know what to do if we, uh, in response to uh, a learning style, and there's some substantial questions as to whether, they, whether or not it really makes a difference. There are uh, published so far something over 40 different models of learning styles. No consensus on what a learning style is. Uh, the measurement, uh, the measures are generally of very low quality. Uh, they uh, tend not to measure anything that's, uh, that's unique uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a statistical sense. 
uh, they tend to measure lots of times, unfortunately, just intelligence. Um, uh, another thing, uh, uh, another question is what should we do in response? Well, ideally, you'd want something, some kind of an interaction like that where it would make a difference. But if you look at the, rea at the uh, uh, recommendations, the common learning styles, lots of times they say, try a little bit of everything for everybody. Well, heck, if you're going to do that, then why bother? And finally, does it make a difference? Well, there's lots of tantalizing preliminary evidence out there in the literature, but large-scale studies, when they are attempted, uh, typically wind up with very inconclusive results. And that's not a new finding. That's been true in every review of research that's been done on this. Starting in 1977, I read the most recent one like this having to do with reading uh, about a month ago. So I would argue it's a homeopathic fallacy. Stock, and I'm here to explain to you how emotional hijacking can. Can you all hear Prescotta? No. Then turn on the damn mic, Prescotta said. <laughs> Try it again, Prescotta. Okay. Now, can you hear Prescotta? Okay. Yeah, just wait a minute then. <laughs> you may be an expert in emotional intelligence and all that, but being an expert and getting people interested in your subject are two completely different things. Well, Prescotta, I, I know that there's a difference between... Byron, Byron, I've seen you present, and let's face it, you're not as eloquent as Tiagi or as humorous as Claude Lineberry, and God knows you're not nearly as good-looking as Steve Yellen. You want people to learn something about your subject, don't you? Well, of course I do, Prescott. Now, now you're starting to get me a little worried and feeling anxious about this talk I had planned. Hey, you weren't planning on showing that brain slide, were you? That thing is boring. Well, I, I was, but but now I'm a little worried about even showing that, Prescott. Well, uh, listen, if you take my advice, I can help you with this. You don't want them to think that you can put together, you can't put together a good presentation, do you? No, I don't. Hey, wait a minute. I see what's going on here. I'm letting what you say emotionally hijack me. Uh, what do you mean by that? Ah, you'll have to come to my session on Thursday to find that out, Prescott, huh? Will I see you there? Well, uh, what time? 11 o'clock, and I promise it won't be boring. Well, okie dokie then. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steve Yellen. session of the year 2000 International Performance Improvement Conference and Expo in Cincinnati, Ohio, USA. Of course. I am Guru in Training, Shri ISPIG, Groovy Nomad Technologist, and your official conference, Hip P T. Though we travel different paths, speaking many tongues, 
Our diversity is our power. Now, take a couple seconds, exactly three, please, and greet someone next to you. Peace. 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 Cool. Making connections. That's what it's all about, my friends. Though some of us may seem unusual. As we talk, learn, and grow, our prejudices melt away. We can unite in a single voice that will spread our message across the world. Because all we are saying is give P.T.S. a chance. Oh, um, hey, Just before we begin, and the timer hasn't started, how would you like to do a presentation after that? <laughs> okay, how many of you work with subject matter experts to help them build training pr programs that are effective? A few of you? Yeah. Tell me, are subject matter experts more focused on content or on learners? How many say content? Learners. Uh, would you like to have something that can help your SMEs transform that dreaded telling info dump into wonderful, effective, learner-centered, performance-based training? Yes. yes, because at the end of this session, that's what you're going to be able to do. And you'll be able to name the five steps that transform telling into training. The first thing, get your SMEs to give a reason why the learners should learn. Sounds simple, but the research tells us that that's effective. So, we need a, thank you. Next, make sure that they clearly state the reason, what they will be able to do with the, as a result of learning. In other words, state the, good. Third, rather than talking a lot, you need to get learners engaged immediately in, again, good, I just want you to be active and make sure along the way that we verify that they've learned by creating if they get it right, I'm sorry, if they have a problem, we need to give feedback. What kind? And if they get it right? So, to summarize, there are five steps for getting the SME to convert telling to training. The first step is provide a rationale. Next, clear objectives. Third, engaging and meaningful. Then, in terms of the objective, and if there's an error, and if they get it right, I confirm. How did you like my previous approach and appearance as a guru? I want to share a little bit of my autobiography. In 1967, I came to the United States. When I went to get my visa, the council officer said, whatever you do, don't trust New York cab drivers. And I went and bought my ticket at Swiss Air. They said, you got to transfer from JFK to LaGuardia. Whatever you do, don't trust New York cab drivers. I got down at JFK with a little baby and my wife and when we got out a cabbie grabbed my luggage and said get inside so I said how much is it going to cost he said don't worry get inside sat in the cab and he started talking I said should he not turn the meter on he said don't worry 
and he went around and round and I was sure I'm going to be abducted. He kept talking and he said, tell you what, can we stop by my apartment because my wife has never seen a sari clad person. She would like to meet your wife. And so he took me around and I was sure he was going to charge a lot. When we came to LaGuardia, I said with trepidation, how much do I owe you? He said, no charge. Welcome to the United States. Two learning points. Number one, don't trust the natives to tell you about what's happening in their culture. <laughs> Second point, when you want to drive home, a key learning point, tell a story. Forget about web-based learning. A few years ago, I was in a cabin up in the Sierras, and I woke up in the morning, and I was cold. I defined a need. Well, I knew what results I wanted. I wanted to get warm. So the question is, what could I do about it? The next question. There are a couple of alternatives. I could go down to Starbucks, get in the car, and go down to Starbucks and have a cup of coffee, or I could go out and build a fire. I was a good boy scout, so I knew how to do it, so I decided to build a fire. And then I did it. These four levels of purpose-driven, five levels of purpose-driven behavior have been extremely useful to us in a variety of kinds of analytical situations. We found many, many uses for it. For example, one use for it is in the area of delegation. If you've got a brand new employee, you may have to sit down with him. You have to specify the need, the result you want, tell him what to do, how to do it, and he does it. If you've got a little more mature employee, all you have to do is specify the need, identify the needs, specify the results, what to do. He knows how to do it. Get out of his way. Let him do it. Again, a more sophisticated, all we have to do is specify, identify the needs, specify the results. They knew what, how, and do it. And if it's a level four, even sit down and talk about negotiating the results. Now, we do this, we use this same model for looking at delegation. You do not have to go to a four-day course on situational leadership now to handle the different levels of maturity, this kind of thing. One of the other interesting things about it is we find some managers always delegate at level one, okay? no matter how competent their people are. When you get below specifying results with competent people, you are micromanaging. So keep that in mind. Keep the little model in hand. It's very useful. Good evening. My name is Guy Wallace. I'd like to talk with you about uh, something we call performance modeling. There's two parts to performance modeling. One is to chunk out what we call areas of performance or segments or major duties, key results, areas, etc., etc. You can use many different ways of chunking this out. Sometimes it's quite arbitrary. It could be chunked out a different way and it really doesn't matter as long as you capture the totality of the performance and minimize gaps and overlaps between your chunks, these areas of performance. This is an example for the most convenient store, store manager, uh, based on some actual work. When you take one of those chunks then, you can do this performance model which contains two parts. On the left hand side is ideal performance, the first three major sets of columns, the key outputs and measures, the key tasks, the roles and responsibilities. You simply ask questions, in this area of performance, what do you produce? What are the outputs? How do you know when you're done? How do you measure it? How would you know a good one from a bad one? What tasks do you do to produce that output? That's where our task analysis goes. And then to clarify roles and responsibilities, you can articulate in a, in a collaborative environment who's doing what. If it's a single performer, then you can skip those roles because it's just one job. The right-hand side constitutes a gap analysis against that ideal performance. And I often look at the measures for an output and ask typically, are we not getting outputs that meet those measures and standards if we can find them? If I find what those uh, performance gaps are, if I'm really looking for qualified uh, employees and I'm getting poor choices made and unqualified candidates, however the master performers or subject matter expert articulate that, you can then do probable gap causes or if you have a lot of time you can do root cause analysis and make darn sure you're really getting to the root. But if you're dealing with master performers who bail out other performers, often they know what the causes are. And then you contribute those causes back to a deficiency of environment, 
deficiency of knowledge and skills of the performer or deficiencies of their individual attributes and values. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Janine Walker, and tonight I'm going to share with you some New Zealand magic. This year, Team New Zealand, in a boat named Black Magic, sailed to victory in the America's Cup, the World Cup of Sailing. New Zealand, a small Pacific island of four million people, competes with the money and technology of the world's sailing elite and wins twice. The first non-American team to success successfully defend the cup in its 150 year history. Magic. Black magic. Yet what's the formula behind the magic? Simple. One challenge for purpose and vision. One inspiration for meaning. One focus for direction. One team, one future, one dream. And the key ingredient being the inspirational players that brought the magic to life. Simple yet successful. The kind of magic we can use for coaching our leaders, developing our teams, for creating an innovative environment. So, catch the magic. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Lovett, and I'd like to invite you to please put aside your papers, sit up straight, and close your eyes. Good. Now we're going to do a quick activity to hopefully allow us to make use of all we've learned tonight. So please, riffle through all the ideas you've heard and choose one. And I'd like you to, to ask you to visualize yourself applying it to your work in a really successful way. What do you see yourself doing? Good. Now, imagine that somebody says something to you that you associate with the success of the technique. What do you hear? Great. And finally, I'd like to ask you to imagine that you feel something, a bodily sensation that you associate with that success. What success feel like to you? Gently open your eyes. And now, uh, just in order to uh, really capture all the feedback and all the ideas that I'm sure are percolating in your heads right now, when I lower my hand, I'd like to hear uh, 10 seconds of tremendous clamor as you describe to me all the ideas that you chose and how you're going to implement them. Go! Oh, come on! Oh! Ah, oh, you're killing me. Well, we're out of time. Thank you, folks. I want to thank Ellen and the rest of the ISBA staff for putting this thing together. I want to thank Roger Addison, my co-conspirator. I want to thank all of the wonderful presenters. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you for making this a successful session. That's all, folks. Thank you very much.